connect with Dave. So I've just started recording. Um, and so this is the last session of the Keys webinar series. Hang on, Dave, I think you're talking to me. Hang on. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I've uh, done with the microphone. Um, increase the volume to you experience any increased volume. Yeah, I think it's better. I think it's better. Okay, let me take it right to the top. Just try talking to them now, Dave. Okay, I have my volume set right at the very top. Okay, I think it's better. Um, so Dave, just for your... Uh, I'll meet Dave. So just for your benefit, Steve, are you happy just to introduce yourself? And then Bev, are you happy to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Okay, so what if Steve goes first? Okay, hi. Sorry having so many difficulties today. Um, I'm Steve Easter. Um, I'm in the UK. Um, I'm a PhD student concerned about citizenship for young people who have learning disabilities. Hi, um, everybody. I'm Bev. I work very closely with Kate. I work at Avivo and I'm also uh, associated with WACE. And yes, been very involved with the Citizen uh, Keys Network webinars. Okay, thanks, Bev. Okay, so like I say, Dave, there might be a couple of people joining us later on. Um, as you know, this is the last in the series. We've looked at each one of the keys and had some fabulous thinkers, practitioners, um, come on and join with us their perspective about that particular key. So given because of the, some of the sound stuff, I'm just gonna hand over to you. I'm gonna put us all on mute and then we'll see where we go if that's okay. So. Okay. So when I considered this, um, this chat that we're going to have. Um, I know that the issue of isolation and loneliness for people with disabilities is just epidemic um, through all, pretty much every society that has measured uh, the uh, interaction between people with disabilities uh, and um, others within their lives. So what I wanted to look at is a couple of different things. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with sort of how we understand relationships and particularly those relationships which people ask me most about and that is loving sexual relationships and I'm going to go from there to a variety of other relationships uh, but that's where I want to start and I wanted to start by telling you the story of a fellow with an intellectual disability who has been referred to me um, because uh, he I discovered the phone sex line. And once he discovered the phone sex line, let me tell you, he used the phone sex line. Uh, and when the bill came in at the end of the month, uh, it was something like uh, for $1,600. I mean, it, he, he spent a lot of money. Uh, and of course, people were extremely upset about that. Um, so I, would, I was brought in and I sat down with him and I, I talked with him and I asked him some of the questions um, uh, regarding uh, sexuality uh, that would help me understand it. In one month, uh, it, it's easier for you to masturbate when you're on the phone with this woman than when you're not. And he said that it was much easier to do so forth. So that sort of led us to some idea. Uh, and this is maybe a little controversial, but one of the things that we do with people with displays who have already discovered the phone sex lines is that we will make erotic audio tapes that they can listen to in place of them. Um, so that was done. Uh, he was given that tape and the following month uh, the bill came in and it was for something like $800. So we essentially cut the behavior in half, you know, 
one. And any behavior would be thrilled to have got a behavior in half uh, within just one month. But the organization, like most organizations, are run now more by accountants than they are by visionaries. So um, they, they added those two numbers together and decided that that was just way too high of a bill to pay. Uh, so they just got rid of any therapy and just put a cap on its home line at home. Now, let me just describe a little bit about who he is. He lives in his own home. He is fairly independent. Uh, he has access to the community. He has access to a variety of people. His family has disowned him, so he has no relationship with his family. Um, and when he goes to a sheltered industry where he um, is pretty much of a loner and doesn't spend much time with other people at all. Um, so anyways, um, so that's the situation uh, in which he found himself. And I was aware of it. I was aware of all of it. Uh, but nonetheless, let me tell you what happened the following month. The following month, um, I got a call from the organization. They were very upset because um, the day program that he uh, worked in was over here and head office was over here. And one of his jobs was to deliver mail. So he would go over there and he would come into the office and he could read so he could see who was in, who was out, and who was on vacation. Um, so he would go in to the office of somebody who was out or uh, on vacation or off sick or whatever, uh, close the door and pick up the phone and make phone successful. So at the end of that month, um, they got a bill for $300 for phone sex calls made from head on. I mean, uh, this guy, he was determined, all right? Um, so I'm back in. Now, forgive me, I'm clinically arrogant. I kind of thought I gave him a solution why isn't it working? So in my mind, I'm thinking, I need to know more about what happens on that phone text um, so that I can replicate it if we need to. So I sat down with him, and, and I, there's going to be some graphics that will pop. Okay? Um, but I sat down with him, and, and I said, OK, can you, can you tell me exactly what happens when you get on the phone? And he said, well, he calls her. Um, and you know what? He always spoke to the same woman. Always spoke to the same woman. He was monogamous on his own bed. Um, and and he, he said to me, sometimes it sounds like she has a different voice. Well, I, I'm, I'm not going to explain that. Right? So, oh, uh, Nick, you have come in at so the wrong time because I'm now going to start talking about this. Um, but, Nonetheless, so I uh, start I say to him, so how did the phone sex call start? And he said, Well, she tells me about my her body. And I said, Well, what do you know about her body? And he said, Well, she's got really big tips, really big tips, really big tips. And of course, I'm taking notes for for you know, for God's practice, really big tips. Um and 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 she tells me that she She's touching her titties and her nipples get really hard. You know, and she tells me that she really liked me to kiss her nipples. Uh, and I tell her that I really like you. And then she tells me to get my cock out of my cap. And she starts cutting down at her pussy. And then, and then and he said, well, uh, and, and, and then the white stuff. So I'm like, OK. So have you ever asked somebody with this really a perfectly stupid question? Well, here's mine. I said, so um, yeah, uh, yeah, feel good? Uh, and he looks at me like, yeah, bad boy. And I you know, felt pretty good. Try it, so. um, anyway, so it felt good. And I said, so then you hang up the phone. And he said, no. And I'm like, no? He said, no. And he whispers to me. He said, then the good stuff happened. And I said, good stuff? Okay. He said, yeah, the good stuff. I said, well, well, what's the good stuff? And he said, 
Well, she 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 asked me about my apartment, and she asked me about my job, and she asked me about and she asked me about and she asked me about. And I discovered that that phone call um, had like this much to do with sex, and this much. Can't see it. Where do you write? Um, this much to do with isolation, loneliness, and disconnectedness. And I missed it. I missed it. Like I said, I knew he was in the apartment alone. I knew he was alone here at the tape program. I knew that and I missed him. And and so I ended up doing really bad clinical work with him. And, and this is not an excuse for bad clinical work, but I think the reason why I missed it, the reason why I missed it was How does that make him different from so many other people with disabilities? I think the uh, the fact is that people with disabilities often live such isolated and lonely lives that it's really hard for us to see it, to actually see it when it's in front of us. Uh, and he made that very visible. But what, there was something else that came very clear. Um, there was, he was experiencing two different Kinds of intimacy. Um, obviously, that the sexual uh, behavior that was happening as he was speaking with her on the phone, but also the kind of social intimacy um, that we have with people in our lives, people who are interested in us, people who ask us questions, people who make us feel valued. That's the thing that really mattered to him, and that's the thing. Um, that kept him on those phone calls. And one of the things I came to realize, and I think for me it was one of the most important realizations of my work in the area of disability relationships and sexuality, is the drive and need for intimacy is greater than the drive and need for sex. And let me say that again. Uh, the drive and need for intimacy is greater than the drive and need for sex. I think his real drive there was to reduce the pain of loneliness and reduce the pain of isolation and reduce the pain of feeling like he mattered to no one. So those calls are really, really important. And you know, it's, it's interesting because when people with this place come um, uh, to me and that I work in the sexual clinic, um, I, I, I can tell you, all the years that I've done this work, I have never had a question by somebody with a disability to which the answer was, uh, penis goes into vagina. Never once. Never, never once. The most common question I get is, how do, how do I meet somebody? Um, how do I know if somebody is my friend? How do I know if somebody loves me? How do I know? I mean, those really basic questions about, you know, what, about the things that I need to know in order to live a life where my intimacy and needs are being met, uh, where I feel important and valued and so forth. So the reason I bring this up first is one of the things that I find interesting is that whenever we talk about you know, relationships for people with disabilities, most people are very interested in the issue of sexuality. And that's what they come forward with, uh, at least to me and the work that I do. Um, but I think that people are missing the point. They're not really understanding what uh, needs that are, are, are met uh, in, uh, in friendships and love relationships and so forth. Uh, and that the pain that people can experience are from simply not having those. You know, I once had the opportunity to um, to do a presentation to a, a, a high school, uh, uh, grade 12 students. I don't know how you guys grade your name, your grade, but grade 12 was the last candidate. Um, and so I was called and I was asked if I could go up and speak at sex day. Um, because what they did, uh, they had a like mini conference where they brought in speakers, they had a keynote speaker, and people did sessions and so forth. And I had been asked to be the keynote speaker, and, and the fellow said that he wanted me to do the presentation because uh, he heard that I was funny and all of that. And I'm like, okay, well, I've never spoken to high school students about 
sexuality ever before. He said, well, you know, I don't think you have to do it. So I, I, I said, give me a day. I drove up to the school, teeny tiny little school, teeny tiny little school. So I figure at max, the woman is going to have 20 kids. So when I drive up there to do the presentation, there's like cars everywhere. Like there's just cars everywhere. Uh, and I have to park a long way from the venue. Uh, and when I when I get there, I discover it's sex day for the region, like not for that school. And I walk into an auditorium of 500 students, 500 teenagers. Okay. Now one of the things that men will are is that women will never understand um, about the male body is that when men get very frightened and anxious, our genitals actually pull back into our body. That's actually true. So I want you to know I got onto that stage with a lump in my throat. I was terrified. Okay? I was just terrified. So, you know, I, in, in the first few seconds, I, I, I mentioned that I'm fat. And, and yeah, I had to do that pretty much right off because if you don't, you've got all the students there sitting there uh, thinking, I wonder if you know. I wonder if you know. And as soon as you say that you are, they go, oh, thank God he knows, and we can let go of that. Well, I had thought long and hard because I actually take my job seriously, but what I wanted to say to these kids. So I, I ended up <coughs> hitting stride, and I said, I want you to know you've been lied to. You've been lied to by the, by, by, uh, the school. You've been lied to by your parents. You've been lied to by the media. Because you all think you understand sexuality, when you don't understand some version of ab A and the sloth B. Okay? And I said, let me tell you this you have no idea, no idea about, about sexuality uh, until you understand. Um, sorry, just for a second. A noise game just disturbing. Okay, you will not understand uh, the sexuality until uh, you know what your heart is. You know, I think part of the problem is that in all of our training, people with disabilities and people without, it, we have focused the training on the genitals and not on the heart and the soul and the mind and how we interact with other people. Uh, so people have this store of knowledge uh, regarding sex with absolutely no other skill. Um, and a parent came to me once, and uh, she was very angry, and she said, how dare, how dare you teach my child about sex uh, uh, when he doesn't have a friend? How dare you teach my child about sex when he doesn't have a friend? And that's a really smart thing to say. She's saying, you're leaping into these skills here when he doesn't have the basic skills of friendship. So, um, let me let me go and tell you about my ancestors. Okay, uh, of all of my family, I'm probably closest to ancestor. And I I I get nervous when I do presentations and so forth. And, um, I have to deal with it in a variety of different ways. But one of those ways is um, I never invite family to hear me speak. I mean, why would you do that to your son? Okay. You know, if I blow it here, you're in Australia. Um, uh, but um, if you blow it in front of family, they're going to bring it up over and over and over again. So, but I was talking to Invest on the phone, and I realized I was going to be uh, presenting in Calgary, and she lives just outside Calgary. So I asked her if she would come. So she said, Oh, I've always wanted to. Hear you. Well, I, I talk on, on a number of different uh, different topics, and as we were uh, driving into Calgary, I was looking up to see what I was going to be doing, and I had just invited Aunt Vesta to come and hear me talk about sex for a whole day. For a whole day. Um, and I'm like, oh, shit. Um, but then I realized she's a farmer. She's a farmer, right? So she's pulled cows out of cows, uh, and occasionally teenage boys out of sheep, you know what I mean? So. Uh, this is not something that's going to be terrifying, right? So um, I do the presentation, 
we go out out. And I said, so what do you think? And she said, you told the story I really didn't like. And I'm like, okay, what story is that? And I'm thinking about, yeah, is it the Wolf's doll story? Is it the Dildo story? I mean, which one was it? Uh, and let me say, which one? And she said, the one about the two guys. And I said, I don't have a story about two guys. And she said, yeah, you do. And I said, no, I don't. And she said, the one you like, the one you don't. This is a tiny little story. Uh, and what it was was to get across the point. So let me ask you all a question, and we'll see if this mic thing works. Um, so what is the single most important social skill for the maintenance of human relationships? Okay, the single most important skill for the maintenance of human relationships. And this is not for people with disabilities. Or for people without disability, it's, it's, it is the, now this is not also Dave's opinion, this is research, okay, so the single most important social skill for uh, the maintenance of human relationships is, somebody want to give it a shot? Uh, just ability to chat to other people. <laughs> okay, well that's, that's all right. No guesses. All right. Um, well, you were very close. Okay. So the single most important social skill for the maintenance of human relationships is reciprocity. You give to me, I give to you. If you take and take a look at your family, you know those people that God says you have to love, those people? Um, if you take a look at your family, uh, if there's somebody in your family where you discover you're doing all the giving, and they're doing all the taking, if you were to tell the truth about that relationship, you don't like it. You don't like being around. Okay? Um, so reciprocity is a really basic skill. And let me tell you, reciprocity is a skill that can be practiced by people with the most significant and profound disability. Uh, it is astonishing um, that um, you'll, you'll go into a group home with people who have uh, non-traditional communication, they don't speak, and they don't have any other way of, of communicating, and then the staff will clearly have favor already have favorites and when you when you pin them down as to why is this person your favorite why do you feel more attached to this person in every single case it's because of reciprocity you know they'll say things well i come into the room and her eyes light well that's giving that's giving i'm getting something back you know uh, um or you know whenever i seem to be with them yeah, they seem they seem to be happy and buoyant. Well, that's giving back. Okay, so so reciprocity is a is a, is a well, it's a social skill. And in terms of relationship, so I tell this tiny little story about reciprocity. I was working with two people uh, with intellectual disabilities, both of them who were offenders. That was my job. Um, and I I saw them twice a week, okay, an hour each time. So I, I fall in and I'm off to work for a couple of days. So I haven't seen them uh, for the entire time. They knew I was off sick, but I haven't seen them the first day back, the day back to work. I go in an office, sit down, and the first guy who comes in, his name is Rick. And Rick, the moment you saw me, started me, 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 and more, me, 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 me. Now, if I told you the truth, and I'm not allowed to, but if I told you the truth, you know, he hurt my feelings, and he pissed me off, and I don't like it. I just don't like it. Because I get nothing from him. But I did my job, because I paid to do my job. So I took the notes, I did the thing, I asked the questions, and I finished that. 
done with him and the next guy and then they were gone. Once one was the most sweetest people you'll ever want to meet, you know. And he came in the saw me and said, Oh, oh, Dave, Dave, you were in the hospital. I was so he's like we're here. So let's deal with that first. Uh, and then he sits out for a second and he said, You know what I'm gonna do? And I said, What he said, I'm gonna make you a cup of tea. And I'm like, God, we only have an hour and and he said, no, I'm going to make you tea. So he goes off and, and he makes me a cup of tea and I bring him to the tea, he sits down, I'm sipping on my tea and, and, and we change a little bit and I notice things the angry tone was like. So I say to him, you know what I think we should do just in the last little bit here, let's catch up a little bit so I know how things are going. And you know what he said to me? You know what he said? He said, not today, Dave, you look really and I was like oh I like this guy I like him you know um and when I quit my job there I I come back as a consultant actually to this very day I always called on and I never called so how can you not like that story I mean, of all the stories I told, that best didn't like that story. I'm like, ah, you don't like that story. It makes the point. And she says to me, well, that guy you like? And I said, yeah, Don. She said, I'll bet you pretty much everybody likes him. And I said, you're right. I mean, Don is very well. Okay. And that guy you I don't like, what you said name of this? Rick? She said, yeah, Rick. She said, I'll bet you nobody likes well, in fact, nobody does. Nobody does. And I, I agreed with her. She said, well, well, maybe I don't understand your job. And I really hate it when people say that because I know I'm about to get named. Okay? Maybe I don't understand your job, but if somebody is doing something that makes people not like them, isn't it your job to teach them to do things so people will? My first thought was stupid. Um, but nonetheless, okay, she had a point. She just had a point. So I called the agency and I said, I really misserved her, okay, or him. And you know what? I, I, I'd like another shot. I'd like another shot. So we set it all up and he agreed to see me and I sit in exactly the same office. And he comes in, and it's now been years since I've seen him. And he was like, me, 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 me. I'm like, hold on. Okay, just hold on. That you come in here, and you just talk about you, and you don't even ask me how I am. I said, Rick, that hurts my feelings. It pisses me off. It makes me not like you. So we're going to start differently. Okay, I want you to step outside and then step back in, and I want you to say, hi, Dave, how are you? So he's like, whoa, and he comes back in, and he's a big guy, and he looks out at me, and he says, hi, Dave, how are you? And I'll tell you, I start to answer him, and I'm taking my time. Now, this guy is so unlisting, unused to listening, he starts to prompt himself under his breath as I'm talking. He's going, listen, listen, listen. And that struck me as very funny. I don't laugh because I'm therapeutic, but I thought it was very funny. Well, here's what I discovered about this. And I think this is one of the biggest mistakes we make about people with this world. Okay? Or particularly people with intellectual And that is, we always believe they have skills and choose not to use them. We always make that assumption. That they've got these skills, they're just not using them. Okay? Uh, but in fact, when we got to the core of what his social skills were, um, he, he didn't have any of the skills uh, that would be necessary uh, to be in any kind of relationship, friendship, winning. Okay? 
You just simply didn't. And you certainly didn't have the gift of reciprocity. So as I, as I did that, um, I really discovered something. Yeah, everybody just liked Rick, and he knew it. He knew it. He knew he was the favorite of no one. He knew it, and he felt it, and he didn't know why. Um, and, and you have to understand the human service system is really set up uh, to reinforce uh, behaviors that are not at all uh, consonant with being in relationship to other people. Okay? Just the way we manage what we do. Um, people with disabilities uh, who live in a system where they're surrounded uh, by other people with disabilities and a group of staff who can see them or are valued more than them. And they'll do anything they can to get attention. Attention-seeking behavior essentially uh, says, I want the attention of somebody who's valued. I want that attention. And they'll do anything to get it. And when they get it, it's reinforced. So they're constantly being reinforced by inappropriate behaviors. To get and then we wonder why they don't just naturally have this raft of social skills that will get them into relationships in the real world. So I began to, uh, to work with it, and, and we were going at it, and, and it got to the point where I thought, we could transfer this to the staff. So I meet with the staff, and this is all with his permission, of course, and I, I meet with the staff, and we go through a, a bit of a training, and so if, rude, if, if Rick does something kind of rude or bombastic, all you need to do is say, Rick, Rick, when you do it that way, it hurts my feelings, all right? When you do it that way, I don't like it, you know? So here, I'll do it this way instead. And if you have to give him words, give him words, right? Well, I want you to know, I got a call the next day. The next day. Let me say that again. The next day. Um, and it was, it's not working. It's not, it's the next freaking day. It's not working. Um, you know what really boggles my mind for people who work in the field of uh, disability is that it's like they go through this interview and they sit there and say in some version, well, I think, you know, I have a lot of patients. And then, of course, lose it this, the moment they walk into uh, work with people with disabilities. And on top of that, they forget that disability means they have difficulty learning and they're not single trial learners. And they're all really frustrated because they're not learning after one thing to cross. Did, 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 did you read the definition? Did you read the definition of the people you serve? I mean, it's the next day. I mean, if they, if, if, if they, if they were like single trial learners, they'd be brighter than you. Like, like stop it, you know? Anyways. They kind of got it because I was, and I did yell. Um, so they began their work. And it took us about a year to teach him a variety of different social skills. But let me tell you the end of the story. Rick has been married for years. He's been married for years. He's happy. He has a circle of friends. Okay. And he has a circle of friends because he's got these skills. Um, one of the problems that we have, I think, is, as people who work within service systems or uh, in whatever capacity with people with disabilities, is that we let people with disabilities off the hook with poor social skills. You know, and we don't think that that's our job to be teaching social skills. Well, I want you to know, whatever a person with disability is that interacting with me, um, I'm thinking about the social skills that they have carried into that interaction. Um, and I have, I have no difficulty with teaching people under those circumstances. Now, teaching doesn't mean humiliating, and it doesn't mean browbeating, and it doesn't mean nagging, and it doesn't mean any of those things. It means teaching. It just simply means teaching. Um, so people with disabilities from, uh, are, are not getting the opportunity to learn those social skills. Because I, I talk to all these staff, and they take people with disabilities out into the community. Um, and, and they're expecting some magical 
uh, formula uh, that will make uh, the people with disabilities suddenly meet people who are friendships and so forth. But let me tell you, without social skills, those friendships are never going to form. They are simply never going to okay, um, because the, the social skills are like these, these little hooks we have all over that allow us to connect with somebody else. Uh, and allow us to just share time with someone else without it feeling like a burden. You know, that, 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 and people with disabilities have just never been given the opportunity. Let me just do this as a allegory. I, I just, I don't even know if allegory is right, so don't look at it, okay? Except that it's, yeah, it is. Um, just the other day, I, I did a session for people within uh, and as it happened, I had a group of people with disabilities who uh, had been institutionalized and so forth. They were uh, in the 40s and 50s and so forth. But uh, there was also a significant group of people with disabilities who had come through the school system and had lived in the community. Uh, now, they both have the same kind of disabilities, but they have very different histories. And I wanted to know that almost every one of the kids that came in to the session I was teaching could read, and almost none of the people with disabilities who were older could. So I, I just I think that the reason people with disabilities don't have the social skills necessary is because nobody's teaching. If nobody's teaching. You know, and until we see that as an integral part of our work, and until we take the uh, opportunity uh, for people with disabilities uh, to learn what those skills are, well, uh, we're going to have, have significant. Um, okay, so I, I have one more thing that I, I wanted to say, but I noticed we're getting close to 10, and you wanted me to leave some time for questions. So I'm willing to do that now, or uh, I could go on and do the other part. However you want me to handle that from right here. I've just muted you, Dave. So Nick, just so that you know, we've got you'll, you'll have gathered, we've got a bit of a problem with the audio. And when any of us speak, it has a really big impact. Um, so we need to keep Dave on mute while we speak. So um, if that's a pause, Dave. Uh, Nick, Bev? Steve, any thoughts, anything you want to add, think about? Give me a sense with your hand and then I'll unmute me and mute you. Unmute you. Okay. <laughs> it's um, been a challenge just following because of the sound quality, but it's been, been a, a amazing and makes complete sense to me. I once had a discussion with, um, I was uh, managing a, a, an adult uh, service for people with uh, uh, learning disabilities and um, a student um, whose supervisor wasn't around or whatever was um, stuck with a situation and she said um, she couldn't understand why the young woman she was working with was uh, so difficult and being so obstinate about moving house. And I, and I just had a little intuition about didn't this woman have a child and isn't that now looked after by the grandmother and um, could, could it be that she's trying to hang on to this two-bedroom flat because actually she'd like a child back very much and the student just kind of like no no she's just being difficult <laughs> I'm like no I'm not having that she's not just being difficult she's being left in the flat on her own well, all the good things are happening somewhere else, you know? And uh, unfortunately, I think in different ways, we see this happening all the time, don't we? Well, we really do. And that reminded me of a situation that happened up in uh, Leeds. I had been asked to do a presentation on a day-long presentation for people with intellectual disabilities up there. And, um, and so we were 
we were, we were getting through the day and it was going well and people were participating. And um, then when we came to lunch, uh, there was a, a young man with a disability that um, I went to speak to because I really liked his shirt. I really liked his shirt. And I, I wanted to take a gift back to a friend, so I wanted to know where he bought the shirt. So as it turned out, his mother buys all his clothes, so he had no idea, you know, um, and I wasn't going to call his mother. So he, uh, he asked me some questions about Canada, and I'm like, uh, I, I asked him, but I'm, not, I'm much more interested in his life, you know, and so I asked him to tell me about his life. Now, this guy could be the poster child for the community living with the poster child. He has his own apartment. He has a full-time job where he makes a real salary, okay? So, and those have been the two prongs upon which we think um, somebody needs to be successful at in order to have arrived at citizens. You know, so he's done that, so I, I said, okay, well, that, that's cool. Uh, but what do you do? Like, I, I wanted to get a sense of the social life. And I said, like, do you go to the pub? Do you go here? Do you? Or he said, oh, no, I don't go. I said, you don't go out. He said, no, I don't go. And I'm like, ever? And he said, well, he has a staff that comes twice a week and, and helps him with his laundry and helps him with that. And they sometimes go out for a cup of coffee. But... The rest of the time, he never moved out. So this guy is maybe 22, 23 years old. He's a good-looking guy, um, and I'm a, I, I, I have I, I have difficulty understanding this. You know, like why don't you go out? And so I pressed him a bit, and he said, "Well, it's hard to say." And I said, "Well, could you try?" And he said, "Well, you know, um, when you make friends, but they're not really your friend. They just..." take your money and they take your stuff. And I said, yeah, I, I know um, people who do that. And he said, well, that happens to me all the time. And he said, I, I don't go out anymore because, because I can't tell. I can't tell if someone likes me or if somebody just will take things. And I said, so, so what's it like for you? And he said, I'm really, really lonely. I'm really, really lonely. So I said, have you talked to your staff about it? Because I find in a lot of situations, people with disabilities simply bear with things and, and don't come forward. Oh, yes, he said. Well, good for him. And I said, well, what did you tell your staff? And he said, I told my staff what I told you, that I can't tell uh, when somebody wants to be my friend or when somebody just wants to take things from me. I can't tell. So I don't go out, and I'm lonely. Um, and I said, and what did your staff say? Now, just forgive me here, because it still really upsets me. Like, really upsets me. She said, oh, that's okay. I'm your friend. What? What? I mean, that's supposed to be enough. And I just, I just, what kind of person can have somebody sit in front of them in pain saying, I am lonely, I am isolated, and I lack the skills necessary to form the relationships that I want in my life and the person to simply say, well, I'm all for you. Um, and that's supposed to be enough. Now, she's going to go home to her family. She's going to go home to her kids. She's going to go home to her life, which is a real fucking life. And she's going to be leaving this guy completely alone and isolated because he lacks skill. Notice he didn't say, it's because I'm being bullied or uh, because of this, because of that. He simply said, I don't have the skill to tell between these two things. Well, you know what you're supposed to do when people don't have skills? Frickin' teach them. That's what you're supposed to do. You know, but we, well, we'll do anything but teach. Okay? 
Uh, oh, it's just so hard. Well, yes, it's work. Okay. Um, but nonetheless, that doesn't mean you don't do it. Um, so it's just, it happens all the time uh, where, where staff just refuse to read the situation in the way it needs to be read, even when it's presented to them point blank by somebody who can say very clearly what it is that they're needing. Very clear. And it, I still don't understand the kind of cruelty um, that that represents, because it's just cruel. Um, and for somebody not to recognize that this woman's had a child, the child has been taken away from her, um, and what the trauma is for that, and that, that just, you know, no, 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 no. Disabled people don't have those kind of meaningful connections in their lives. I don't need to consider that. I just need to consider that they're a jerk, you know, um, and, and it's just, it's, it's so patently unfair to people with disabilities in terms of the way that they're, they're, they're being treated and so forth. So, yeah, I completely agree. Nick, so I've just muted you again, Dave. Nick, Bev, have you got any thoughts you want to add at this stage? Nick? Hi, folks. Sorry, I was a little bit late. Thanks, Dave. At moments, I didn't know if I was in some sort of a stand-up comedy show or if I'd walked into the right webinar. I love you. I love your style. I love you. your 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 quite blunt, direct style of calling it how you see it. I appreciate that. Um, and you, from the little glimpse I've had of you, you strike me as someone who's incredibly pragmatic as well. Um, where this is, and I yeah, I, your comments to me um, are about um, how. Support, support people are often taking people out into the community, hoping there's going to be some sort of magical formula or that's going to kind of result in the situation of people developing friendships and relationships. Um, and, and that's just not happening. Yeah, I, that resonates for me. Um, and I see that. I, and I hear what you're saying about social skills and that we all need to, we all need to kind of develop um, the capabilities to navigate relationships in our social world. I think what's what's coming up for me is maybe like a bit of a tension between the that that pragmatic that pragmatic aspects of that versus um, maybe a bit of a like a voice in me is is kind of saying what's to say that the the teachers aren't just kind of. Uh, then sort of projecting their own worldview on how they think people should be or getting try, trying to get people to almost be this sense of normal in order to fit in versus sort of appreciating people in their uniqueness um, and supporting people to still, I guess, navigate relationships, um, having the capabilities to do that, but appreciating that, you know, the, the way in my skills are maybe different from someone else's skills and that's okay. And I didn't, and it's not about me trying to teach someone else the same skills as me necessarily. Um, maybe there's some aspect of that, but maybe there's some aspect that's about an, uh, appreciating people as they are in, in their unique qualities too, um, and supporting them to find um, the people who appreciate those gifts that they have to offer. Um, so that's kind of where it's taken me. I don't know if that's a, it's probably more of a comment than a question. I guess I'm curious as to your, your thoughts on that. And maybe it's, maybe my question is about kind of how striking the right balance between that pragmatism and the, um, yeah, valuing of people in their uniqueness. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. As a fat gay man in a wheelchair, um, I, um, I, I get unique, you know, um, and, um, firstly, uh, I'm really, really careful um, uh, when we do any of this kind of work because um, I don't want staff to use themselves as the model for teaching others. Okay, I think that's dangerous. And I think it's dangerous on all sorts. I don't care whether you're teaching somebody how to tie a shoe. You know, if a person with disability could tie a shoe like you tied a shoe, they wouldn't have a disability and you wouldn't have a job. 
you know. Um, so I, I think um, that we have a God complex in this field um, because we're constantly seeing ourselves as a model. I mean, if you take a look at, at the studies on, on marriage, 54% of, of, of non-disabled people, when they marry, they get divorced within 10 years. Uh, there's only been one study that was ever done on people with intellectual disability, um, and it was like 90% made their 10th anniversary. So we should be teaching more. Um, but, but so this is where I rely on the literature, okay? Um, because I don't, I want to move it out of opinion. So um, we were we were asked a number of years ago to um, to do an article for a magazine in Canada for parents of of young kids with disabilities, um, and it was to be on friendships and relationships and so forth. And we we said in the opening of the article. Uh, it's wonderful that you love your children, but no one else has to. Um, so you need to make sure that you're you're teaching your children the skills necessary to be lovable. You know, um, and so then uh, we spent a lot of time looking up what those skills were, the basic uh, social skills, and they're very simple. Okay, when we published it in an article. Um, and it was wildly popular there, wildly popular, because they could see really basic things that they could be doing uh, to be teaching these social skills. Because uh, these social skills aren't all that, aren't all that um, complex. So we did rewrite it uh, for adults and published it in um, the journal for um, direct. The International Journal of Professionals. And do you get that journal? It's free. They're one of the editors of the journal. So um, if there's somebody that I can send it to, they can send it out to everybody. I'm more than willing to do that. Um, we are in our eighth year of publication, and it's, it's, it's a journal that is aimed specifically at direct support professionals. And these are the people that you're talking about now. About you know, who are going to be doing the teaching. So we're taking this out of the realm of, um, of what do you think somebody needs to do? Um, because um, we have had difficulty uh, in my own home agency, even though I, I'm director there and, and I'm out of the closet, all the rest of it, we've had difficulty with, with staff and how they dealt with uh, people who are transgendered or uh, people who have other kinds of differences and so forth and they have feel they have a right to impose their particular beliefs on people and so we need to be very cautious of that and i agree uh, so that's why we went and took a look at what is the literature say? so now we're not separating people with disabilities from people without disabilities we're just looking at what what are, the, what are the skills necessary for people in, in order to form healthy relationships? So uh, I will dig up um, the, uh, that particular, it's an old one, so I will take you more time. But I'll dig it up and I'll send it on, and then you guys can take it. And if you want to subscribe, it's free. Thanks, Dave. Beth, is there anything you want to say? Are you there, Beth? I don't know. Beth, let me know if you want to give us if you want to comment. Um, okay, Dave, um, back over to you. Um, well, what time are we, are, are we finishing? So we've got until half past ten. Do you want to use the next time for any questions, or how would you want to use the next slot of time? Hang on, hang on. Sorry. Right, go. 
I, I have another thing that I was going to talk about. Okay, uh, and this this also may get a little bit more uh, to uh, next to me. Um, I want to tell you about a man who's named Toby. Um, I met Toby when I went down to Northern California um, to do a presentation to couples with intellectual disability. I'd never done a couples workshop for people with intellectual disabilities before, and I was really excited about it. So I, I did all the work that I needed to do and put together the presentation. And I arrived, and, and I, I noticed Toby right, right off, okay? Um, because Toby, guy, he was unique, okay? And he was unique in a couple of different ways. Number one, he had carpenter syndrome. Now, I had never heard of carpenter syndrome before, and it took me a while to find out. Uh, I described him to people for over a year, and then somebody finally said he had carpenter syndrome. And carpenter syndrome looks like uh, if, if Bob put his thumb into a baby's eye and then twisted it, so the eye was indented and turned, and then the rest of the head radiated. And I'm only bringing that forward because he had an obvious uh, intellectual disability. But what was cool, he was completely and totally and 100% out of the closet with his discipline. And he, he could make jokes about his disability. One of the jokes that he made was his girlfriend, who was a wheelchair user. Um, he said, see her? See her, that one over there in the wheelchair? You know what? You know what? I was normal till I met her. He said, now, that's funny. I mean, the fact that he could joke about the relationship, but he could joke about his disability means that he's vastly comfortable with his disability. So I, I go in to start teaching. And and I'll tell you, it was really difficult, really difficult, because um, Toby was this big, bombastic guy. Okay? Uh, he interrupted, he made jokes, and about Every 10 minutes, he'd come to the desk where I was sitting at in front and say, got to take a piss, got to take a piss, got to take a jerk of this, and that's where he go. Then he'd come back about 15 minutes later, stinking of a cigarette, and then he'd be there for about another 10 minutes, and he'd get and walk up to the front and say, got to take a piss, got to take a piss, got to take a jerk of this, and that's where he go. And after that, I just said, Tony, when you've got to pee, just get up and go for a pee. Okay? And he was like, oh, that would be rude. Um, well, um, this is much better. Um, but anyway, okay. So we we, we get through all that, um, and I can tell that the staff who are in the room assisting me. There's only two. I don't allow more than that. Uh, there's only two. I can tell that they really disliked him um, because he was so interrupted and that he was. But I'll tell you. Um, Sometimes people think that I have a prejudice against them people. You know, I don't have a prejudice against them people. I just don't understand. I don't, I don't understand how they get all the recordings and all that little kind of space. And maybe that's what makes them so mean. But, um, um, but I'm really not prejudiced against them people. What I am prejudiced against is people who have thin souls. You know, and I think souls are meant to be abundant. And Toby had an abundant soul. I have met so many people in human services that I think that their soul needs an extra pudding or two, you know. Um, but not Toby. He has a soul. Um, so we go in and and uh, we do this session, and the, the, the couples are working through the various things that we're doing, and 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 and, and we we end with a with a big role play that goes very well. And I'm very pleased. But this is an important story. I am very pleased. I think I did a good job. Okay? Um, this is the problem. When you are your own evaluator, you are always brilliant. Um, so, and I, I'm feeling it, you know, like, holy shit, I did good. Right? So it's all over. And everybody's gone except for Toby. 
okay, um, and his girlfriend because they're waiting for uh, the transit system in the town uh, to come and pick her up. So I approached Toby and I said, so Toby, did you learn it? Uh, and he said, you're funny. I said, well, thank you, Toby, um, but that's not what I asked. I wanted to know did you learn it. And he said, this was lots of fun. He's avoiding my question. So I'm like, Toby, I really want to know, did you learn anything? And he said, well, no. No? No? I worked really hard to put that together. I worked really hard to deliver it. And he didn't learn anything. My first thought was, well, if you didn't have to leave the room for a piss every 15 seconds, you would have learned something. Um, because it had to be about him, right? And I said, so you didn't learn anything? And he said, no. Now, forgive me for the language I'm about to use. It's the language I don't use. Um, but I, I find that if you're telling the story about a real person, um, to change their language for the sensibilities of an audience, uh, first he makes a story. And he, this is what he said. I said, so, so why didn't you learn anything? And then he said, it, it's cause, it's cause, it's because, it's because, it's because retarded people don't do it that way. And I was just shocked. Okay, partly by his use of the R word, and partly by saying, what? He said, yeah, that's it. Retarded people don't do it that way. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, you know the thing at the end where you sit down and, and, and you know, you, you talk, uh, what you call that? And it said, uh, negotiation. He said, yeah, negotiation. We don't do it that way. I said, what do you mean? He said, I say to my girlfriend, you want to fuck? She says, yeah, we do. I say to my girlfriend, you want to fuck? She says, no, we don't. He said, that's how we do it. Okay. Um, now, I didn't tell you the story just to use those words. It's what he said next. And you really need to hear this. Your people's problem. You get that? your people's problem. He's saying there is a him and his, there's an us and ours, and there's a difference between the way we do things. Your people's problem is you always teach us to do the way, do things the way you do it, and we don't do it that way. What you ought to do, he gave me advice, what you ought to do is figure out how we do it first, and then help us do it better. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Because it takes you out of the context. Okay? So we need to start there. And when, when this comes to the whole issue of relationship, he's saying disabled people do relationships differently. Okay? Now, I talked about general uh, uh, social skills. I'm not changing what I said, to them. but in terms of the context and in terms of how these relationships run and how these relationships work, um, that's where it makes a difference. Okay, so I want to just give you just a couple of examples. So I get a referral uh, for a couple who, who they fight, and not and not physical fisty fights. It's verbal fights. Um, and it, it can happen anywhere. It can, it can happen in the mall. It can happen in a restaurant. It can happen on the bus. It can happen and something will, will set this off and they'll set at each other. Okay. And, and apparently what they say to each other is pretty mean, a little bit chalky. Okay. Um, so they're referred to me, right? So they come in and, and they sit down and, and we're, we're talking about this and I'm explaining to them that when they get into these fights, people really notice and, and that, you know, it, it upsets people to hear this and all that. And they said, well, what should we do? And I said, well, what 
we do, you know, just think exactly like what we said I would do. Well, what we do is if we get into a scrap, we wait until we get into the car, or we wait until we get home, uh, and, and, and then we deal with it. And the guy looked at me and said, Dave, do you, do you remember I'm disabled? And I'm like, yeah, what is that going to do? He said, I won't remember what I get. I won't remember. And I thought, yeah, yeah, you probably won't. You know, um, yeah, that is your disability. You know it better than me. Uh, and, and here I said and thought, but who cares if other people are noticing? Who cares? You know, people spat all the time, you know, um, and are, are we are we holding this a couple to a higher standard now? And, and, and in fact, I think part of the problem that leads to the fact that we have such a high divorce rate is that we just they keep taking these issues that aren't being dealt with and throwing them to this massive sack behind us. And by the time we've gone together for 10 years, it's just too heavy to carry, you know? Um, and here at this couple is they, if something happens, they deal with it, it's done. I mean, maybe that's okay. Maybe that's not how we do it, but maybe that's okay. And maybe that's none of our business. And part of what I think we have to learn is when things, uh, when to intervene and when not to intervene. So I chose to just let it, just let it, because uh, it's simply not fair. Okay. Um, and let me tell you about another company. This was in Victoria, British Columbia. This is where I went to university, where I got my BA. And I was, I was lecturing uh, to a group of people with disabilities in one of the classrooms that I went to, okay? So it was awesome, right? And this was on abuse prevention. And part of what we do there is we talk about glad, sad, mad, and scared. Um, so we're going through the various emotions. So what are some of the things that make you happy? And this is where you see the universality of the human experience because they don't say anything different than anybody else does. It's family, it's friends, it's food, it's, it's dogs, it's outings, it's, it's all sorts of different things that people like. But this woman put her hand up and she was seated next to her boyfriend and her boyfriend had his arm around her and she was just sitting very close. Nothing inappropriate, but she was sitting very close. So she put her hand up and I said, yes, what makes you happy? And she said, I'm happy because I'm here with my boyfriend. And I'm like, oh, oh. So I turned to him, turned to him, and I said to him, so sir, what makes you happy? And he didn't even take a second to think about it. He said, hockey. And I'm like, Hockey, I, she just said this lovely thing about him. And I said, sir, you have a lot to learn about relationships. And he said, no, I don't. I can make her come. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> anyway, so if you can make her come, you can watch whatever you want. And tell them again, but, um, but here's the thing. She was sitting next to her boyfriend who had his arm around him, showing perfectly appropriate, open public protection. Perfectly appropriate open public protection. How many women in my life do I know who don't have a disability that would like to have somebody in their life that could show them perfectly appropriate open public protection? You know? So here at the very core, he was showing me um, without even saying a word, that he had these relationship skills. She felt special. I mean, I think the reason she put her hand up was at that moment she was feeling so close to him, both physically uh, and geographically or whatever, um, that she wanted to simply announce it. Okay? So he does, people with disabilities may do it differently. Okay? 
okay? But that doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. Um, the relationships, too, that um, we might see uh, with people with disabilities. Um, during the closure of the facility, there were two uh, men with intellectual disability, uh, both of who had a profound intellectual disability. Um, and in the institution, uh, they were on a board where this fellow here uh, sat at the end of his bed in the morning, staring at this wall over here. This guy here uh, sat in his bed over here, staring at that wall. Okay? Now, because they had more needs than anybody else uh, on the board, um, the staff got everybody else ready before going to these guys. So they sat there for a relatively long time, and it wasn't uncommon for them to occasionally leave their body. Okay? So years passed. Years passed. Uh, the institution is closing. So they moved. He was there. They moved there. Completely different towns because we did it stupidly. Uh, it was you went to wherever your parents paid taxes. That's where that's where you were now going. Right? We never look at the fact that you know we rip people out of people's homes and, and maybe they form relationships and maybe they have friendships and maybe other kind of things and maybe they should uh, be allowed to continue those on. No, no, no. That would be like maybe kind. Um, so the fellow here falls into a huge depression. Just a huge depression. So when, because I was involved in doing a lot of the institutionalization, so when I was sitting down with the staff, I was going through, okay, all this, the basic kind of question, relationship question. And as soon as I asked them the relationship question, they said to me, they said to me, oh no, oh no, oh no, 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 no. Um, oh no. Um, um, he's, he's really low functioning. As if that the population of people for whom you don't have to think about relationships, but they don't have those. Okay? So, now, so I was like, hold on, now did he have any favorite staff or any staff spend more time with them? Were there any other residents on the board that he seemed to gravitate to or just be with and so forth? Oh, no, 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 you don't understand. You don't understand. He's really no function. Okay, so no information can come from prejudice. All right? You just you can't filter through. So as we began doing the work uh, with him, I asked about the routines in the morning. And this is when I discovered that there was another fellow who sat facing the upper wall. And so I, I went and I had to get permission. And I did get permission to bring these two men together. And when I brought them together again, nothing happened. Nothing happened. Until one of the staff who was with me had this idea of turning your chairs away from you. So they were back in the position that they had been in the institution. And once that happened, this fellow over here made a pooping sound. I can't even imitate the sound, but it was a pooping sound. And this guy laughed. And it just went back and forth. The boop and the laughter, the boop and the laughter, and the boop and the laughter. Nobody saw it. And nobody valued it. Um, so nobody wrote it down. Uh, people with displays have relationships in a different way. Uh, and those ways all need to matter. And we have to get much better at spotting the relationships that people with displays do have. Um, well, you know, they sat uh, by each other in the workshop for 12 years, never said a word. You know, there's no relationship there. You have no idea whether or not there is. Or, you know, what did you look for? What we do is we look at our relationship as a model uh, and our friendships as a model 
And if they don't meet that model, well, then they're raising So <clears throat> disabled people do it differently. Now, there's a difference when disabled people do it wrongly, okay? And they do it wrongly. That's where intervention needs to occur. I'm going to tell you a story that you're going to find hard to believe, okay? But I swear to you, right now, is that the Boy, Boy Scout? I swear um, that this is absolutely true. So we got a, a, a call from a group of staff uh, who were very upset. A man in their group home was dressing up in his room as a woman. Now, he didn't ever come out of his bedroom. He didn't go into the front room until there was only in his room. And the staff, of course, caught him in his room. And the only reason the staff caught him in the room is because the, uh, the agency uh, didn't have decent policies on privacy, right? So my boss and I went out. And, you know, we don't do this. We don't do this. He wants to dress uh, and women's clothes, it's none of our business, you know. Our job is really to say to them, you know, you need to learn to how to be supportive to people who do things differently and so anyway. So we pull into to park, and a guy comes out of the house, walks on the front lawn, undoes his zipper, pulls out his penis, and takes a pee on the front lawn of the house. And I have to tell you, I have never been so pleased to see somebody engage in wildly inappropriate behavior. Because I said to Susan, my boss, I said, this is it. This is it. We can go in and say, hey, this guy is exposing himself on the front lawn. <coughs> Maybe we should work with him first, and then we can work with the guy upstairs. So while we're working with this guy, we can subtly get the message across that there's nothing wrong with what the other guy is doing. We have a plan. So we go in and sit down. And we say to uh, the, the staff, um, I don't know if you noticed this, uh, but one of your residents uh, left the house and went out the front yard and pulled out his penis and took the key. And they said, oh, yeah, that's, they said, oh, oh you're aware of this. And they're aware of this. And they didn't refer to this. They're aware of this. A, a guy who does this regularly, apparently, is like pissing on their lawn with his dick exposed in a neighborhood. You know, like, whoa. And we're like, uh, well, we think we need to talk about this. Oh, people don't mind. They know that he has a disability. And I'm, oh, good. So we, we suggest very strongly, since what he's doing is engaging in criminal behavior, criminal behavior, that we work with him for the people, for the guy upstairs. And they were like, no. No, no, we want him out of those dresses. It's not okay for him to be in those dresses. It makes everybody in the house uncomfortable. We said, who, uh, the other residents? No, they don't know. Well, who does it make uncomfortable? It makes us uncomfortable. And this is our workplace. And we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, um, when people with disabilities do it, wrongly, like pissing on the front of the lawn with their dick hanging out, that's when you interfere, okay? That's when you intervene. The people with disabilities are upstairs in their bedroom with a dress on. Shut up, you know, just shut up, okay? So, but we just, we just sometimes intervene when we shouldn't and not intervene when we should. And we've just got to figure out what those two things are. Okay, so that was the last one. So uh, we've got, according to my watch, about six 
uh, minutes uh, left for questions, comments, or discussion. Bev, do you want to give it another go? Bev just messaged me and she was trying she was trying to talk, but she's going to give it another go. I think this might have worked. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, great. I feel really disconnected um, because I'm sitting and watching all of you and I'm I'm actually echoing your expressions and it's really um it's really a strange feeling, but um I found a lot of humor in what, what you've presented, but I also found a lot of depth, Dave. So thank you very much. And it resonates for me because um, when I was a lot younger, um, I used to volunteer in a home for people with disabilities, be it mental or physical. And at that stage, I was a 16 year old girl and um, there were children younger than myself. There were people much older than myself. Um, this was back in South Africa and um, I left South Africa and I went back for the first time last year and I went back to visit the children who were now grown people in that home and the most beautiful thing happened. I saw people in relationships with their childhood sweethearts. The sad thing for me though was that their parents had abandoned them so all they knew was the people within the confines of their home, but that was love enough for them. And it was bittersweet for me, you know, it really was because I remember when I was 16 thinking, I don't know what it would feel like if I had no mother or father beside me. And then I, when I formed relationships with, with different partners in my life, I thought it's okay that I don't have my parents, I've got my partner. But when I went back to this home last year, I thought, this is what it's all about. If your love is strong enough for somebody and um, your connection with someone is strong enough, it doesn't matter actually who that person is. It made me feel very happy, but very sad at the same time, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks, Beth. What about Steve, Nick? Anything you want to say before we finish? Other than it's been a screen? <laughs> no, you both. Oh, hang on, Dave. I'll okay, miss. yeah. Oh, go on, Steve. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, been a re really amazing time, hasn't it? And um, a lot of things that Dave said has resonated with me um, and, of, of some of the bizarre and crazy things I've seen at times. Um, and and also that you need to just just push on to to try and bring about the changes that really need to happen um, that make make sensible life for people. Um, I, I think that all too often I found myself in jobs or roles where I've not been able to tell it like it is in the way Dave can, <laughs> um, which which has been a shame really. Um, uh, people would have used the council's rules about you mustn't speak to colleagues like that or you mustn't do, you know, so, so sometimes you're not able to catch the people in the moment and have to leave it to the staff meeting when it seems a much more kind of balanced and tame, tamed down kind of uh, discussion about we really need to handle this in a much better way, you know, um, but, but also at a different in a different life, um, being um, a parent of a young man with profound disabilities, um, being able to kind of just uh, see that there are some people he would turn on to and smile and some people he would just blank. And there was no point in persuading him to talk to the people he was blanking because he'd already decided I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to engage with you, you know. So, um, yeah, I brought, yes, uh, I, I guess 50 years of my life has flashed before me in this last uh, 40 minutes or hour or so. So, yeah. Um, and, yeah, keep, don't, don't stop believing. Keep making it happen. Yeah. Thanks. Nick, anything you want to 
No, I must be honest. I'm pretty wrecked. I've had a massive day, um, but I've really appreciated the session and it has actually been really energizing. Um, yeah, it's kind of given me some really uh, interesting things that I want to explore around, particularly around the, I guess, the, the skills side of things. So yeah, really appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, same for me, Dave. I definitely think the thing about reciprocity and um, skills and the thing that's just really resonated is like we're waiting for this magic thing to happen and not kind of looking at it really practically, I suppose. So it's just been lush. And it's so fabulous to see you haven't changed a bit in your directness, your humour or your bluntness. Um, and yeah, it's been fabulous. So thank you very, very much. And definitely send the article over to us. I will. Thank you very much. Okay. Champion. Thank you, Dave. See you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, everybody. Well, thank you touch. for the whole series. Thank you yeah, so much. I'll be, I'll be in touch because we've got a couple of ideas of what we might do with the series. So I'm going to get in touch with everybody who's been part Thanks. of it. Okay. Thank you. See you later. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.